My name is Demita Taylor. I'm 26 years old. I was born in Ayr, which is just south of Townsville, and throughout my life I've slowly moved down the East Coast. And I converted to Islam, I think it was 2007. It's funny, I don't remember exactly what it is. <laughs> um, my family, I, can't, I have a brother and a mother and a father, as you do. Um, my, my mother and father, I, th I don't want to label them with religious things. But I think they would be titled as agnostic, if not atheist. My brother, um, I have a running joke when I talk to people about my brother, I call him. Um, he makes atheism look like a fundamentalist religion. Um, but that has its history as well. Um, talk about my my mom comes from Bundaberg and in her religious experience she lived in a time where Protestants walked on the other side of the road of Catholics so I think that has a profound effect on on her uh, affiliation with any religion and that sort of thing also affects my brother's affiliation with religion um, my father's family are Baptists, and I used to go to church with Grandma and Granddad, and I would actually ask to go to church with them, and I would ask my mum to take me to Sunday school, which I'm sure she didn't mind because it's free babysitting. Um, so throughout my life, um, I actually reached out for a religion. Well, Christianity was there, and I went to an Anglican school, and and as part of that schooling system, you do attend church and the, the, the Christians who do so take the communion and that intrigued me and, and that kind of thing. And so I grew up to be Christian, and, but I kind of hid my Bible under the bed and kept it, didn't talk openly about it too much with my family. But I think they knew that I was like religion. And um, when I, I went to Spain and got to see what the Catholics do, and that was nice. Knowing about Islam, I think, can be broken down into different sections. There are times that I clearly didn't know about Islam or about Muslims. I think as a kid, and I only realize this now that I've converted, I used to drive past, um, on the way to school, on the bus, the mosque from Mackay. Every day I'd drive past the mosque. Didn't know it was a mosque. Thought it was a Masonic lodge. It was the moon. I thought it was the same as that, that thing. And they would have gatherings and stuff, and I just thought, well, that's just a community group. Um, but yeah, now that I've converted, I realize it's a mosque. And um, when I, I went to a Christian school, an evangelical Christian school, when I finally moved down to Brisbane, and they spoke of a religion where Jesus was a prophet. I thought that was very believable compared to what I thought was very complicated, a holy trinity of Jesus is the son, but he's also God. And, and that I thought, well, you know, that's understandable that people can believe that. Um, I don't know if my knowledge of Islam increased. I think I was, oh, when I went to Spain, I definitely understood about mosques and stuff because of the um, Islamic occupation of that area. There was clear evidence that of the Islamic empire there and, and the group of uh, the school I went to uh, organized trips to the mosque and spoke about needing to cover when you were there. Um, while I was in Spain, September 11 happened and I think that really sort of made it clear what Islam was. Um, you could label these things now, like it wasn't just someone wearing a scarf and I don't know, maybe they were from Latvia or something, or from some Eastern Bloc <laughs> country. But um, yeah, so I could say, well, that person's Muslim. Um, then, then it came into university 
where, you began, where I began to meet Muslims. I also went to Indonesia near the end of my degree, and that was very interesting. I mean, I was woken up by the Adham and was quite annoyed by it because the mosque was just on the next block and it was very loud. But we also uh, had a good friend who showed us around, like we would take her with us and, and we would make sure that we stopped and she took time to pray and, and we thought it was nice. We got to see the Muslims um, there uh, at, I was in Bandung at, a, at one of the universities there and on Friday the girls would sit in groups and read the Quran. The guys would go off to pray. Um, I remember one incident where um, I was in the office at the university and this guy came in and he had like, droplets of water all over his face and arm and I'm like, I had just been very sick the, the day before and I said, oh, do you have a fever? He said, oh, no, I just went and washed myself because he just made wudu, like the cleaning process before you pray. I didn't know, I was so embarrassed. Um, also, I had a trip to, um, from Bangdong to Jakarta, which I think is about two hours, and the driver explained to me about Ramadan and at the time I thought it was like uh, anti-Christmas in the sense that here Christmas is very materialistic and the idea of fasting appealed to me as it was sort of like giving up material things and uh, self-control and that kind of thing um, which appealed to me as well. So I came to know a lot more about Islam while I was in Indonesia. But what sealed the deal for me was um, well, I met a guy, <laughs> and he made Islam look like something that I could be a part of. When I was in Indonesia, I was like, oh, well, Islam's a very nice religion, but, you know, that's for those people, but I'm Christian. But um, the gentleman, who is now my husband, <laughs> made it seem like something that I could, I could do, and I found out that it kind of fit more with what I believed as a Christian. I think as a Christian I was trying to fit Islamic beliefs about God into it, which didn't really work. Um, trying to fit Islamic um, ideas into Christianity, that is, which didn't work. So I found that um, Islam aligned more with, with my beliefs about God. And but I found that prayer was quite, um, it was good to, to take that time out and remember God. So I kind of liked those sort of aspects, the ritual behind it, that you could go to when you needed it to take time out and contemplate. So when I decided to um, convert to Islam, I um, told the people I met through my husband that I wanted to do this, but I told them not to tell my husband because to me it was so important that uh, he wasn't my husband at the time too. Uh, it was important to separate the con my becoming Muslim from him because no matter how wonderful I think he is, he's not worth waking up at five o'clock in the morning to pray. Really, he's not worth it. So, um, so I really wanted in my mind to separate my. Um, coming to Islam from him. Um, yeah, so that's how I did it. I tried to keep it sacred. It only lasted like an hour. Yeah, I think he knew what was going on. <laughs>
And there are plenty of stories where that has happened and I'm very fortunate to have a very good husband who, um, who treats me the way that Islam expects a man to treat you, which is very well. Um, probably don't treat him that well though. <laughs> um, my friends, um, I'm not a big social person. Um, the, my housemate at the time was like, oh yeah, whatever. Um, probably a bit sad that we couldn't drink anymore, but she's pretty much happy just to stay being my friend because, you know, it's convenient to have friends. <laughs> um, and so she just hang out and we just kept, kept it as it was. Um, it's more with the people who you're not that close with, well, well, that I'm not that close with, that were a bit apprehensive. And I guess the big question is why and yeah, why? I don't think when you convert, you really realise how much it's going to change your life. Like, for example, the family might want to go down to the tavern to have a meal, and maybe, especially if you're wearing a scarf, it doesn't really feel like something you want to do. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with hanging out with, in the tavern, but it's that environment, and I don't know, I just feel uncomfortable. And you don't realise, like, every... everything, not everything, but a lot of things that you used to do, you just... you just have... you just find that maybe you don't want to do that anymore, or it's not really acceptable for me to be there. I mean, it was easy to cut down on the drinking, and I think that was a good thing, and maybe some other things that I shouldn't have been doing. I mean, that was nice. You do have to change the way, the things you're doing, but it's not like so dramatic. It's just like, hey, let's go there. And you're like, well, no, really can't do that. Like, can't go down to Cavill Avenue in the middle of the night. That's not really kind of the good thing to do. Or night clubbing and dancing, that's kind of out of the question as well. Um, again, just a few things that you just, oh, can't uh, order the Caesar salad. I like Caesar salad. So restaurant choices. Um, I love Chinese. Chinese serve a lot of pork. So that was sad because my brother knows Mandarin and um, he, he just loves to share his culinary um, explorations with the rest of the family and that was hard for him and hard for me because most Chinese restaurants serve a lot of pork. I remember thinking a lot at the time that I put it on about how I would cover to go to the mosque but then I wouldn't cover anywhere else so what's the point of covering at all if somebody sees me at the mosque covered and then they see me at the shop uncovered then I don't really get the point of covering at the mosque except to pray um, so I thought well you know you go one way you, know, you go the other um, that's a very black and white view life isn't black and white but um, so I put on the scarf, and now that the scarf is on, I think, why take it off? And there's problems with taking it off, and that's why I keep it on. Like, um, the scarf is a reminder to pray. It's easier to pray when, when the scarf is on. I uh, know in Indonesia, the girls used to carry around this small pouch, and it had their prayer kit in it, with their, their hijab and their skirts. And that didn't really appeal to me. I've got it all on already. Just wash up and then pray. And whereas I can see me skipping prayers if I need to put the whole thing on and pray. And I can pray on the side of the road. I can pull over. I've got the kid on. I can just pray. So, and people don't like it. But when people say this, but there is an identity thing behind the hijab. It reminds me that I'm Muslim. I get beeped up sometimes when I'm at the lights because I've got a manual car and it takes me a while to get off the lights and I just want to flip them the bird but I go well they'll never forget the day that a Muslim woman flipped them the bird so and I don't think that's very much um, behavior coming of a Muslim woman, woman to do such things or yell or scream or so it puts me in check you know I'm representing people and I need to behave the way that 
I want to represent them because they're great people. <laughs> So how does it change my life? Well, I'm an engineer, I work with men, and I have to cover, and that's fine. I try not to let it bother me. I went into my interview, and I just said whatever, and my confidence got me the job. They said I was the best, one of the best that they had. Um, it's a little bit different when I go on site, and there's um, some people who are a bit uncomfortable with it. Um, but when I get talking, they go, well, she knows her stuff, you know, this is all right. <laughs> and um, the only problem is um, the, the not shaking hands thing, which is part of how um, scarf, our covering, our modesty, um, that's a real off-put. I mean, to someone stick out their hand and you not shake it, it's... It's really hard on them, actually, and um, that's something that's a struggle for me. I'm very fortunate to be married to someone from the Arabian Peninsula where I can see what their life is like and compare it to mine. Um, the only problem with being an Australian Muslim is that I'm automatically part of the migrant community, although I don't know how far my family goes back, but we've been here for a while. Um, so that's, that's the only thing that kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. I think that Islam is completely compatible with the Australian way of life. I think that the Australian values really align with, with Islam about concern about people and it's actually my husband's who's got to change the way his attitude was. It's surprising that coming from a so-called Islamic country, I don't, they don't value people the same way that we do. I know that's an awful generalisation, but um, he was telling me about the high number of car crashes and how he was surprised on our long road trip to visit my mum, how we were counting down the people that had unfortunately passed away on that road. He said, well, if only we started valuing people like that. And so, like, that's just an example of how, how I think those values as Australian are what are the same values that are represented in Islam. I guess about women working is that just like the women's rights movement um, had fought for women to be able to choose between the home and work, Islam lets us choose between the home and work um, as long as we look after our family and I think that's what any woman, whether she's Muslim or not, needs to keep in mind just that's all I think Islam is asking women to do is care for your family. Don't let your children suffer because you're working long hours and they never see you and that's not nice. And I think that's what they mean personally. I'm not a religious scholar, but I think that's what they're telling us. And the best thing about Islam is when you do work, your husband doesn't get dibs on your dough. <laughs> so, um, which is quite a burden for, for the husband, but you have the right to keep it, and if you want to give some to him, well, that's good for you and good for him, but it's your choice. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi